Hi folks, my name is Cole and I have a Master's of Immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at multi-cancer targeting by T-cells. So hang around with me throughout this entire video to get all of the relevant background information so that way we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, if you look in the description below, there's some information on how to get your hands on a free NFT. Now to the topic at hand, cancer. Cancer is described as a collection of diseases characterized by cells replicating uncontrollably. And last year in 2020, 19.3 million new cases and 10 million cancer deaths were recorded. Now this is almost double what it was in 2000. And this is still projected to grow to 24 million new cases and 14.6 million new deaths by 2035. In wealthier nations such as North America and Europe, there is a greater new cancer incidence per population. But North America, Eastern and South Central Asia make up over half of newly diagnosed cases worldwide. Now, cancer is fairly common, and it is likely that you know someone who has had some kind of cancer, as one in five people will develop cancer over their lifetimes. Personally, I know multiple people who have had cancer, and I have had multiple family members who have succumbed to it. And that is not that uncommon, as 1 in 8 men and 1 in 11 women will die from this disease. Even though the incidence of cancer is higher in North America and in Europe, the highest mortality rates from cancer actually occurs in Eastern Europe and Eastern Asia. Cancer is not without financial cost. It has been recorded that over 50% of people are paying out-of-pocket costs between one and $10,000 to manage or treat their cancers. Worldwide, in 2010, $290 billion was spent on cancer. Now this number is projected to almost double to $458 billion by 2030. Now cancer doesn't just arise out of the blue. It occurs from a combination of factors, and there are many contributing factors to cause cancer development. Smoking, obesity, and pathogens account for some of the biggest known contributors to cancer. Cancer is not just one thing. Just as we have many different tissue types in our bodies, there are many different types of cancer that can arise. Of all of the cancer types, lung, breast, and colorectal are the most commonly occurring, while amongst the most deadly are lung, colorectal, and stomach cancers. As time progresses, we've actually increased our available options for treating cancer. Surgery has been around forever, but radiotherapy and chemotherapy have been staples of standard care and have been around for at least 40 years. Recently, Precision therapy and immunotherapy have been increasing in prevalence and effectiveness. Now this can be measured as a proxy through new deals. Immunotherapy deals have now surpassed those of new chemotherapy deals. And the market for immunotherapy has been steadily increasing, with a market valuation of $78 billion in 2019, which is estimated to grow to $158 billion in 2027. Now, in comparison to traditional cancer therapies, which really hope to kill the cancerous cells before it kills you, as the treatments are not very specific. Immunotherapy works with the immune system to fight off cancerous cells and primarily focuses on T-cells, as it is known that T-cell infiltration of tumors leads to better prognoses. Cancer immunotherapies selectively target cancer cells, leading to less off-target effects and thus more effective and safer treatments. Throughout our bodies, we have many different cells that mediate immune responses that all work together to help clear infections or disease. The cells that we're going to focus on today are T cells. T cells are part of our adaptive immune response, which activates after the initial response to pathogens and disease has occurred and facilitates a specialized and targeted response. Now, there are many different kinds of T cells in our body, with about 90% of them making up conventional T cells, which are also known as CD4 or CD8 T cells, which use their highly variable T cell receptors to recognize the antigens presented to them through the host-specific MHC molecules. There are also unconventional T cells, which have specialized functions in the immune system to broaden the repertoire of antigens and ligands recognized beyond the classical peptide fragments presented to conventional T cells. And these unconventional T cells can have highly variable or semi-invariant T cell receptors. An example of unconventional T cells are mate cells, which are restricted by the evolutionarily conserved MR1 receptor on host cells. And these cells have primarily been described to recognize bacterially infected cells by recognizing a vitamin B2 biosynthesis derivative, which is characteristic of bacterial metabolism. The MR1 receptor forms a complex with beta-2M, 
and by inducing mutations in the MR1 receptor, it can be used to express no antigens at all or even prevent association with beta 2M. MR1 is a very interesting receptor, which has limited polymorphisms and natural isoforms, and is ubiquitously expressed throughout the body at varying levels of expression. Thus, it makes it an appealing pan-population target. Recent research, however, reveals that they express a broader range of ligands, and none of which are self-related. Mate cells are not so good at recognizing cancer cells. However, it turns out that the MR1 receptor can stimulate other kinds of T cells. These MR1 recognizing T cells do recognize and kill cancerous cells, and there has been increasing evidence that there are MR1 restricted cells that respond to self antigens. And this function has piqued the curiosity of some researchers. I want to take a moment and really highlight why new cancer research, and particularly research on understudied T cell populations and their functions, are important. They're important because by identifying new cancer cell targets, there can be increased therapy options to those who experience cancer. Human MR1 also has very little polymorphism and thus makes it an ideal pan population target. And pan population immunotherapy targets reduce the cost and complexity of cancer immunotherapy. If you also think that these are some important reasons to be doing this type of research, go ahead and tap the like button. This brings us to the paper that we're talking about today which is called Genome-Wide CRISPR-Cas9 Screening Reveals Ubiquitous T-Cell Cancer Targeting Via the Monomorphic MHC Class 1 Related Protein, MR1, by Crowther and Dalton et al. from Cardiff University, Cardiff, United Kingdom. And in this paper, the authors identify non-mate T-cells that target MR1 receptors on multiple different cancer cells and investigate their characteristics and applications in vivo. They started their investigation by asking if there are T-cell populations that expand when they come into contact with cancerous cells. The authors found a T cell population from multiple patients that expands when in contact with cancer. And they called this T cell clone MC.7.G5, which I don't know why they called it this, because that's a real mouthful and it needs a catchier name if they're gonna do continued research on this. But either way, the authors wanted to know what type of cancers exactly these MC7G5 T cells responded to. So they tested them against tons of different cancers and found that MC7G5 T cells respond to all of them. In order to assess the safety of using MC7G5 T cells for cancer immunotherapy, the authors undertook further testing of these cells against healthy cells from various tissues. They found that MC7G5 T cells do not recognize any healthy cells. So the authors next set out to uncover this specific mechanism of action. And to identify this mechanism of action, the authors utilized whole genome CRISPR-Cas9 libraries to mutate different protein coding genes in the cell. They did this by transducing HEC293 T cells and identifying which protein coding genes had mutations in them to escape killing by these MC7G5 T cells. By having the guide RNA facilitate Cas9 machinery attachment and mutation, of the responsible genes. Through their analysis, they identified MR1 and beta-2M, which again forms that complex with MR1, and a few other genes that work in the MR1 activation pathway. So with this in mind, the authors then blocked the MR1 receptor with antibodies and found that this receptor was how MC7G5 T cells recognize cancer cells. They also identified that very low levels of MR1 receptor need to be present on these cells for the lysis to actually occur. The authors next asked, well, is MR1 essential for MC7G5 T cell recognition? So by looking at cancer cells that had MR1 knocked out or absent, they were able to identify that MR1 is essential for MC7G5 T cell recognition. And they also found that when this receptor was specifically put onto immortalized cells, commonly used for cell culture, or reintroduced to cells that had MR1 knocked out, that this caused the lysis of these cells. Now, this instilled further confidence in the authors that cancer cell recognition was dependent on MR1, but they wanted to know what exactly about MR1 was being recognized. Now, the authors used a mutant version of MR1, K43A, to express MR1, which is not bound to anything, to assess whether MR1 recognition alone was the cause of MC7G5 T cell recognition. And they found that MC7G5 T cells cannot recognize it. This inability to recognize K43 separates MC7G5 T cells from previously described MR1 T cells, which do not require K43 for activation. The authors also looked at MC7G5 T cell recognition of common MR1 ligands. 
and found that recognition was reduced when MR1 was loaded with bacterial ligands. Now, mate cells can definitely recognize these cells, so it's not a matter of there's something faulty with the experimental process, but is indicative of the fact that MC7G5 T cells do not recognize MR1 via known mechanisms. With this information, the authors next wanted to know, well, can MC7G5 T cells recognize stressed or damaged cells? Because maybe that's what's causing the recognition of cancer cells. So they took healthy cells and created conditions that may induce cellular upregulation of cell surface MR1 or generate ligands bound to MR1 from various tissues. They tested activated T cells, activated B cells, and epithelial cells that were exposed to oxidative damage, radiation damage, that were bacterially infected, and that expressed reactive oxygen species. And they found that healthy cells are just incapable of activating MC7G5 T cells, whether they are stressed or damaged. So to examine the capacity of MC7G5 T cells to target cancer in live organisms, the authors used a mouse model of T cell leukemia, which they engrafted in NSG mice, followed by the adoptive transfer of MC7G5 T cells. And by looking at the bone marrow on day 12, they found that MC7G5 T cells reduced the present leukemia T cells. And at day 18, even though MC7G5 T cells were reduced, this still reduces the number of leukemia T cells. They also found similar results in the spleen at day 25. Looking even further than that, the authors wanted to assess how long mice would live with this treatment of MC7G5 T cells. And they found that mice without these cells lived about 30 days with T cell leukemia. However, when mice had MC7G5 T cells adoptively transferred into them, they lived twice as long for about 60 days. To explore the therapeutic potential of targeting MR1 on cancer cells, the authors then purified T cells from PBMCs of multiple stage four melanoma patients and transduced them with the MC7G5 T cell receptor and tested their effects against healthy cells and melanoma cells expressing MR1. The authors found that these T cells with this new T cell receptor can kill these cancerous cells and leave the healthy cells alone. Now, in summary, the authors found a T cell population, which they named MC7G5, which recognizes cancerous cells via the MR1 receptor to kill them. And this activity is specific for cancerous cells as these MC7G5 T cells do not target or kill healthy cells. When testing the effects of this in an in vivo cancer model, they found that when adoptively transferring in MC7G5 T cells, it reduced the levels of T cell leukemia and allowed mice to live twice as long. I always think it's interesting to see how new cell populations can be utilized to treat diseases, but this information is also significant in progressing towards an effective, broad targeting cancer treatment. This paper shows that MR1 can present cancer-specific ligands to stimulate MR1 recognizing T cell responses. This antigen is recognized across many different cancer cell types and continually recognized by a specific T cell receptor. And by utilizing this T cell receptor against the specific cancer antigen, cancers can be eliminated in vivo and allow for improved longevity. Now, all science as it stands is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge. And these steps are driven by questions. And I had a few questions of my own when hearing about this information. The first question that I had is, can cancer-specific MR1 recognition clear different types of cancers in vivo because they only tested leukemia? So can it clear solid tumors like those found in breast cancer? My next question is rather specific in that I'm really curious to know what is the exact ligand that MR1 is presenting? So what about cancerous cells is being presented by MR1 for these MC7G5 T cells to recognize? And my next question, is can MR1 cancer ligand specific T cells be grown to high levels for therapy? My final question though is, what do you think? What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about them in the comment section below. Also, let me know if there are any topics that you would be interested in hearing about in the future. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something, but more importantly, I hope that you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. That's everything for today, so I will see you all next time.